Hello everyone, Aaron here from Rudy Visuals. Hope you're all doing well and keeping safe. In today's video, we've got an exciting review, one I've been actually dying to share with you. It's the Sony A7 S3 and spoiler alert, it is freaking awesome and you know, just check this out. <laughs> Yep, that's right. Finally, we have a fully articulating screen on a full frame Sony body. Mind blown. Now, before we get into this review, let's take a look at some of the footage that I've been able to shoot with this amazing camera. So let us know what you think of the footage down there in the comment section below. And by the way, if you are new here, consider hitting that subscribe button to see more. Now, full disclosure, this is not a camera that I actually bought with my own money. I currently work as a video producer for a university for my sort of nine to five, my daily job. And we needed a new video camera basically. So as an existing Sony shooter, it was a no brainer for me to go with another Sony body so I could continue using my, you know, all my E-mount lenses and my a7 III and R3 as secondary cameras. And having used this for a few different types of videos now, uh, you know, I've done interviews, uh, presentations, events, highlights, stuff like that. You know, I've gotten to really know this camera really quite well. Got some really good hands-on experience working with this camera. Now the S3 is not a new camera. It first came out in, I think, September of 2020. That being said, it's not a cheap camera. In fact, in the UK, you'll need to shell out 3,800 pounds. Now to put that into context, that's more than double the price of an a7 III. But in my opinion, this is double the camera over the a7 III. And there's definitely reasons as to why it costs the price that it does. Now, before we talk about anything else, let's just take a look at the body itself. So if you've ever used any other kind of full frame Sony camera body before, you'll feel right at home. Side by side with the a7 III and R3, it looks pretty much identical at first glance, but you will notice that it is slightly bigger, slightly heavier, and the, the grip is a little bit chunkier, a bit thicker. We get this extra joystick like on the A9 cameras. And of course, finally, the addition of that fully articulating screen. You know, finally we have one of these on a Sony camera. I can actually tilt the screen for those, you know, unorthodox angles, you know, when I'm going overhead or low on the ground, or especially for, you know, filming yourself or vlogging um, without the need of an external monitor. And even the screen itself is nice and clear. And the cherry on top is also that it's a fully touch screen this time. So yes, you can even use the touch screen to navigate the menus as well, like so. The EVF is also excellent. It's seriously one of the best EVFs I've ever used. I wish I could show you how amazing it is. It's so clear, it's so vibrant. It's like peering through a window, basically. It's really good for handheld shooting, for taking images, and of course, for reviewing your photos or images afterwards. The overall feel and you know the build quality of this camera is, as you'd expect, it is excellent for a camera that costs nearly four grand. You expect it to be excellent. And the weather sealing is supposedly improved over previous cameras like the A7S II and the A7 III and R3, which are weather resistant but not completely weather sealed. From what I can see and what I've read, the S3 is not completely weather sealed, but taking out in light rain, for example, you shouldn't have any major issues, especially if you're using it in, you know, with a weather sealed lens. IO is what you'd expect with a headphone jack. You've got your mic input, Type-C, and micro USB multi-port. But with the surprise,
surprise edition of a full size HDMI. So no more of those shitty little micro mini HDMI things you used to use, which I think I've broken, snapped them off so many times. And it still uses the same Sony NP-FZ100 batteries, by the way. And you also get two SD card slots that support the new Sony Type B CF Express memory cards, but you can still use your regular old SD cards as well. However, keep in mind, I would recommend using V60 or even better V90 rated cards as you won't be able to shoot in some higher frame rate modes with the usual V30 cards, which I assume is what most people currently own. With its new high frame rate and higher bit rate video modes, regular V30 SD cards, the read and write speeds are just not fast enough to record on. So the only downside is you will probably have to sell an extra limb to afford one of those new type B CF Express cards or a V90 SD cards, which aren't much cheaper. Their prices will kind of shock you. Uh, the other major change finally is of course the menu system which actually makes some kind of logical sense. If you've ever used any previous Sony mirrorless cameras you'll know that it takes a PhD level education to fully understand. Admittedly I've even had to google mid shoot how to change certain things especially in my first year of owning the a7 III. This time it seems like Sony actually listened and designed their menu systems for you know actual human beings with normal levels of intelligence. It's much more intuitive, it's much more logical, there's things that are grouped together that actually make sense. In my opinion, it's not quite as good as Canon still, which in my opinion is still a lot more noob friendly, but it is a big, big improvement and much a much needed one as well. So under the hood, we have a newly developed image processor and a 12 megapixel full frame back illuminated CMOS sensor with a new color science and what Sony claims is the best in-class 4K video that excels particularly in noise reduction and low light as well as 15 stops of dynamic range and five axis in-body image stabilization. Now, wait there just a second, I hear you saying only 12 megapixels. Why, you know, why so low? I mean, the actual truth is the higher megapixels doesn't really mean much in the grand scheme of things, it's just one factor in the equation. It's been a marketing gimmick used, you know, for years in like cameras and smartphones to make you think that, you know, more megapixels instantly means better image quality. Now, more megapixels only really gives you the ability to like enlarge and crop pictures without individual pixels becoming visible. So for like stills and printing out large images, that's great. But 12 megapixels is actually the native optimum number for 4K video with a 3-2 aspect ratio, meaning it doesn't need to downsample the video, which means the camera can actually read out the sensor really fast, you know, all the data extremely quickly and efficiently. With less heat, it reduces rolling shutter. And in other words, a camera with more megapixels needs to work harder to read the data and then scale it down, which this camera doesn't need to do. So, you know, to put all that into context, the RE Alexa Mini, a camera worth $36,000, that was used to shoot things like Game of Thrones, the Joker movie, and Blade Runner 2049. That only has 7.5 megapixels, so that kind of tells you what you need to know. More megapixels doesn't really equate to better video quality. It's just one piece of a very big puzzle. Of course, with this being a video-focused camera, we get some really exciting additions to its video recording capabilities as well. So the biggest being the S3's ability to shoot video in 10-bit internal with 422 color and in H.265 as well as H.264 codecs. Honestly, the difference between 10-bit 422 and 8-bit 420 is absolutely, it's huge. So most cameras, you know, shoot an 8-bit. With 8-bit, you get to record about 16.7 million colors, which sounds like a lot. But then with 10-bit 422, the camera can shoot over 1 billion colors. So that means you just have so much more flexibility in post-production with how you color correct and how you color grade your footage. You get so much more data. It is to video what JPEG is to RAW, you know, in stills. There's also a bunch of different color profiles that you can now experiment with now, such as S-Log3, which is super flat. You've got Cine4 and the new s Cinetone. So with S-Log3, you get that really, really flat picture profile that lets you, you know, really take advantage of that huge dynamic range, which does require a lot more work in post, but you've got a lot more 
choice and freedom with how you color grade. And of course that newer S Cinetone, you lose dynamic range, but you get a much nicer picture just straight out of camera with minimal color grading required. Now I personally like to shoot in Cine 4, it's what I've always shot in. It's a nice in between. I do like S Log 3 from time to time, don't get me wrong, but I'm just a little bit too lazy to go color grade. And in my day job, I don't really need to do any sort of intense color grading anyway. And of course, now you can shoot at 4K at 24 frames, at 60 frames, and even 120 frames. Or if you're, you know, geographically located like me, it's 25, 50, and 100. And that's all this time with fully working face and IAF all in glorious 4K. You can even shoot in 240 frames a second in 1080p, though I very, very rarely use that. Now the a7 III could only do 120 FPS in 1080p and that was without full face detection and honestly the high frame modes look completely epic on this camera. The only tiny tiny downside is that in the 120 FPS mode or 100 FPS mode you get a tiny 1.1 times crop but it's not really that noticeable. Honestly these days I do mostly shoot in just 25 or 50. I really very rarely use anything higher than that but it's just so amazing to have that option at 4k in 10 bit 42 it's just a luxury that I never thought could be possible in such a tiny camera body like the S3. It is a big game changer and an industry changer as well. Now you still have the option to choose lower bit rates if you want and you can choose to shoot in 8-bit should you want that old school 2018 terrible YouTube look or if you're just sim shooting simple social media videos and you want to save a bit on space. Now one major weakness of Sony cameras in the past has been the rolling shutter performance. Any kind of sort of fast or not even fast just medium panning speed would just result in your image just turning into this and not looking particularly great. The S3 has far and away improved rolling shutter performance as you'll see from these side-by-side -side comparisons with the a7 III. So yeah, I'm really happy about that. It's a big improvement for sure. Speaking of improvements, I can really see the improvements in the new color science as well. So I just really love the crispy richness to the colors of the videos. I think skin tones this time look fantastic, no matter what kind of skin type you have. And the auto white balance just seems to work a lot better in this camera as well compared to older Sony cameras. I also found that Sony really wasn't kidding about this being a low light beast. It has an ISO range from 40 all the way to 409,600 I believe and when shooting in the dark the noise reduction is so much better than with previous cameras. I was honestly pretty shocked at the difference. You can see from these example shots here how clean these evening and darker shots look. And if you want to see more of the low light performance I'd highly recommend checking out Philip Bloom's Now I See video part 2 which just showcases how amazing this does in low light performance. Right so moving on now the in-body image stabilization is decent. It works fine in my opinion. It has five axis IBIS and there is also an electronic IS mode which crops in a tiny bit. I think it's also 1.1 times crop. I didn't really notice a huge difference between this and the normal IBIS mode. It's not going to give you like a gimbal like performance but definitely both modes are better than just turning it off completely. I didn't find that it made my handheld shots that much smoother at least not like in a sort of like wow kind of way but I think for like walking shots you can see that it does improve the footage a little bit it makes it a little bit less shaky I think if you paired this with a lens that has IS it will work even better but for those gimbal like movements you still need a gimbal as for auto focusing the S3 has 759 face detect AF points covering 92% of the sensor with real-time human IAF and animals although with animals it only works in stills and Unfortunately, not video. It is excellent. It's been very reliable. Honestly, I feel like all focus on these newer Sony's are just on par with Canon these days. It's awesome to have IAF now working in video as well in 4K. I can confidently just stand in front of this camera and know it's going to lock onto my eye the whole time. I've shot a bunch of like interview style videos with this and events and it's been fantastic. I didn't really need to use manual focus. I just trusted the autofocus and literally has not missed a beat. With the IAF being so good on these cameras, I don't even bother with manual focus anymore really these days. And I also love the subject tracking feature. So you can just literally just touch what you want on the camera to focus on and it will just stick to that subject. Now we have seen this in other cameras before, but it just works so well here. It's just so easy to do as well. So it is, it just makes shooting things so much more easier. You can also tinker around with the AF subject shift sensitivity and the AF transition speed to suit whatever it is that you are trying to shoot, which is a great feature to have. Now, one area of concern for some buyers is whether this camera has any kind of issues with overheating. There aren't any sort of internal fans, it's all passively cooled, and with cameras like the R5 having a pretty 
a notorious reputation for overheating, shall we say. A lot of people were concerned about the S3 being in a similar boat. It's quite a heated debate. Now, I've not done any extensive purposeful testing myself, but just from my real world usage of using this in my 9 to 5, I've never had a single issue with overheating. But I think unless you're shooting for like hours in the Gobi Desert, I think most of you will be just fine. Of course, the S3 is still a competent stills camera as well, despite its lower megapixel sensor. You can even shoot at 10 FPS continuously. Here's a few examples of just some photos I shot with the S3. So it's definitely not a, a still slouch at all, but it, this is just such a video focused camera. Camera, it's not really worth getting this if you only shoot stills. Something like the R3 would make a lot more sense for something like that, or even an A7 IV, which would be a much better hybrid option. As you can see, the photos still look pretty good. When you sort of touch in and you zoom in all the way in, you can see there's a little bit less detail compared to other cameras. But if you're just using the camera for like thumbnails, stuff like that, perfectly fine. Now we've covered a few of the downsides like the cost, the cost of the memory cards. For some people, the ability not to shoot in 6K or 8K could also be a problem. And also the lack of animal eye AF in video. I'm not really sure why it doesn't work. It feels like it should work, but for some reason it doesn't. It could be some kind of limitation with the processor, or maybe it's just something that Sony can probably roll out in a future update fingers crossed. Other than that, I can't really think of too many other big issues or anything that stuck out uh, that was worth mentioning. So I think that perfectly leads me into my conclusion, which is that the S3 is an amazing, compact, professional level video camera that kind of straddles the line between prosumer and like a full on TV cinema level camera like the Sony FX series. Now admittedly, 3,800 pounds is a lot of money. So it's not a camera designed for casual use in my opinion. If you're like a YouTube and you shoot mostly just like talking headshots, travel vlogs, social media videos, that type of thing, then you definitely don't need 10-bit video. You don't need to shoot, you know, 4K, 120 FPS. You don't need dual card slots. It's probably a little bit overkill for, for you. Get a regular a7 III, you know, use the rest of your money on lenses or on lighting, audio equipment, and you're pretty much good to go. Not to mention you also need a computer device that's going to be able to actually handle all that extra video data. But if you are a working video professional, an existing working professional, you work for an organization, you do things like, you know, wedding videos, music videos, documentaries, short films, interviews, you know, content primarily for the web and you mostly shoot solo, um, then this, I think that's who this is perfect for. If you're doing like larger scale TV movie productions, you work with a large film crew, then something like the FX3 or FX9, that might be a better choice. Um, this would actually be a really good B cam for those of you who do shoot with those kinds of cameras. But for single video shooters, and I think this camera is where it's at, it's, it's who it's designed for. And for me, it's the perfect camera for what I need for it right now. It's like my dream camera. It has everything that I personally need and more. So I love the S3 and I'm very confident that 99.99% .99 of you who buy this camera will be too. Right, so that's pretty much it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, I know this is a bit of a longer one. If you have any questions at all, let us know in the comment section down below. And you can also follow us on socials here and here. And if you thought this video was helpful, then hit that like button and hit subscribe if you want to see more. Totally up to you. And that's pretty much it. I guess I'll see you on the next video. Thanks for watching. Peace.